I've had a couple of people challenge me to do a Fomorian encounter, and instead of picking just one, I'm gonna mash them together. And so the goal of today's encounter, apart from making it fun, engaging, and mixing the two challenges together, is to take a creature's lore and homebrew abilities that stay true to the original creature while making your own game feel unique. And so, hello, my name is Matt, and welcome to my hidden nerdy side, and today, we're tackling the hideous cursed giants known as Fomorian. But first, what are Fomorian? Well, they are incredibly ugly and deformed giants who emit a screeching howl every time they breathe. And honestly, the one you see on screen is probably the prettiest one. However, this isn't a coincidence. There is a specific reason why Fomorians are so disfigured. You see, Fomorians used to be an incredibly handsome race, with brilliant minds and tremendous magical abilities. However, their personalities were not so beautiful and they desperately hungered for more magic and power, which led them to deciding they should try and take over the Fey Wild and enslave its inhabitants. And guess what? It did not go well. And so the Fomorian race was cursed to have their disgusting personalities reflected in their appearance, turning them into the ugly, less powerful giants we see today. Fomorians now reside in the Underdark in lairs with tons of water, fish, mushrooms, and slaves, who they will gladly eat once they can't work anymore. And to keep people out, they smear blood all over cavern walls close to their lair as a warning to all who pass by. However, if it does come to blows, Fomorian can pass on their deformities to others when necessary, and it's one of the few magical powers they can still practice. Now, when we jump over to their actions and abilities, we have a couple of interesting features to play with. They have multi-attack and can beat people with a club, but their two standout features are Evil Eye and Curse of the Evil Eye. Evil Eye essentially just lets them do a fair amount of psychic damage from a distance, but Curse of the Evil Eye is an ability that works in conjunction with Evil Eye and causes creatures to become deformed. Cursed targets get their speed reduced by half and have disadvantage on ability checks, saving throws, and attacks based on dexterity or strength. And this deformity lasts until a creature succeeds on the saving throw, which they can only repeat on a long rest. So it's a really powerful ability to use during combat that can definitely bang up your martial classes in particular. And finally, when it comes to homebrew changes, we're definitely going to be making some, but I think it's better to cover them during the encounter making process. So, now that we've gone over the basic Fomorian lore, info, and abilities, let's build an encounter. This encounter slash quest will be aimed at parties level 11 to 15, depending on how difficult you want to make it, and last about one to two sessions, depending on how long you want to stretch it out. The party's motivation should always be tailored to your campaign, but for simplicity's sake, we'll say your players need to retrieve an eye of a Fomorian king for a quest-related reason in your campaign. Pain. The reason we'll use in this video is it can be used to weaken your big bad enough during your final fight so beating them is even possible, but of course, flavor it as you see fit. So your players need to get an eye from the Fomorian King. That is pretty metal, but just because a quest is badass on its own, it doesn't mean it can't be enhanced with prior setup. So, how do we do that? Well, one way is to have an NPC your players meet early in your campaign be disfigured in some way. For example, maybe they have a bum leg and boils on the right half of their body. Then when your players get to know this NPC, they will reveal this deformity was caused by a Fomorian they trifled with. This way, your players get to know more about Fomorians and what their evil eye is capable of. Secondly, your players could run into slaves being sold to a Fomorian called a Greestus at some point in your campaign. The reason why the Fomorians want the slaves will be a mystery, and the fact they are being sold to Fomorians should not be the focal point of whatever quest your players are on so you can save them for later. But this will help build disdain for Fomorians while also creating more mystery around them and this Agristus character. And finally, having separate NPCs talk about the dreaded curse bestowed upon Fomorians and how it stripped them of their beauty and tremendous magical effects 
affinity will further drive home their awful nature and also introduce the fact that without the curse, they could become even stronger. But anyways, all that will happen throughout your entire campaign. But let's talk about the more central quest regarding our video today. When it finally comes to your player starting to think about taking down your main villain, an ally NPC, who we'll say is a talented magic user in your world, will bring up a letter that has been making its rounds in many cities and towns. This letter will be from a creature called Agristus, the so-called Fomorian King. In this letter, Agristus has demanded all neighboring settlements have 60 days to pay him tribute, or else he will come and take over their lands by force. But what's even more troubling is that Agristus claims, The curse that shackles me has been lifted and with my powerful gaze I shall bestow upon those who deny my rule with my previous affliction. The wording is important for two reasons. It lets your players know the Fomorian King has returned to his previous and more powerful form, and two, it lets your players know the Fomorian King still has the power to curse with his eyes. But at this point, your magic using NPC or alchemist or whatever you choose will have a brilliant idea. If your players can kill this Fomorian King, not only will it potentially save the lives of many people in the area, but if your party brings the Fomorian King's eyes back to the magic user, they can potentially use them to create a weapon strong enough to weaken your big bad and make your player's future fight against them much simpler. So your players will delve into an underground area in your world to find and defeat the Fomorian King. Now you can obviously personalize your underground dungeon any way you see fit. You could add Fomorian scouts, escaping slaves, traps, alarms, or whatever else you desire. But I'm gonna skip to the actual Fomorian hideout. Your players will enter a massive cavern stretching several hundred feet long, wide, and tall. In the middle of this vast cavern, there will be a large settlement of houses where dozens of Fomorians live. However, there will be a few other key elements to this encampment. One, there will be a large stone bridge that stretches over a 150-foot gap in between the settlement. And underneath the bridge, there is a 100-foot drop and many houses that lay with in the gap. Two, there will be slaves of many kinds tending the mushroom fields to the west of the settlement, and these mushroom fields will be run by Myconids the Fomorians have captured. And three, on one side of the cavern there will be a man-made dam blocking a massive river from entering the cavern. And on the opposite side of the cavern there is a cliff that drops down thousands of feet into a dark abyss of nothingness. Now you probably see where this is going. If your players are able to destroy the dam, they can fill that entire 100-foot drop under the stone bridge with water and send a large amount of Fomorians off a cliff. And this strategy will seem rather appealing because, like I said earlier, there will be dozens of Fomorians in this encampment, like I would say no less than 40 to 50. So if your party just charges in there, they're going to have a difficult time. Now of course, there will be some Fomorians guarding the dam, let's say 2 to 4, and you can place some alarms in the area that the Fomorians can either trip to bring more Fomorians or use to alert their allies to get the hell out from under the bridge. But once they're dealt with, your players will have to come up with a way to blow up the dam. How they do so really doesn't matter, so go with whatever reasonable idea they have. However, it may not be as simple as blowing up the dam, because it's not just Fomorians under the bridge. There are also slaves, and your party can and discover this with minimal investigation. So now your party has a dilemma. Do they try to get the slaves to safety first and risk being swarmed by way too many Fomorians, or are the slaves a necessary casualty? If your players say screw it, then the dam will burst and only 15 to 20 Fomorians will remain, while the rest are carried off the cliff. However, if your players have a soul, they may try to sneak into the settlement and talk with the slaves. How your players organize the slaves to get out from under the bridge is entirely your player's call and will be really interesting to see, but your party will also be able to discover two things. Firstly, the reason why the Fomorians have needed so many slaves isn't just to upkeep their settlements and use them for food, but also because the Fomorian king has been using them for sacrifices in order to break the curse. And secondly, the Myconids will assist your party and distract some of the Fomorians, making your fight with 
with the king as simple as possible. And yes, they will absolutely be turning a few into Fomorian Spore servants. So check out the monster manual on page 230 to learn more about how to do that. So now the stage is set. Your players will blow up the dam, the slaves will flee, and the Myconids will begin their attack and turn a couple of Fomorians into their mushroom slaves. Your players will see all this chaos as they make their way across the bridge that now rests above a newly formed river. And due to the Myconids' help, your players will only have about four to six Fomorians to deal with, and of course, the Fomorian King. Now one thing that will be immediately noticeable about the Fomorian King is unlike his followers, he is absolutely gorgeous. So get the prettiest NPC photo you can find and apply it to him. But also, he will be quite a bit more powerful than a typical Fomorian, and I've included a full Fomorian King stat block that is worthy for our King. I won't go over everything, but there are a few key elements I'd like to mention. For starters, not only is the Fomorian King much stronger, but he also has the capacity to cast up to 6 level spells. Which spells you'd like him to know, I'll leave up to you, but I have left some recommendations on the stat block, and I would recommend he only knows a handful of spells. This not only keeps things simple, but it also makes sense since he's only recently acquired his refreshed form. He will also have legendary actions, of course, but they will be rather simple, essentially allowing him to move, attack, or use a cantrip. But his lair actions are what make him super, super spicy. Because now that our Fomorian King has his magical affinities back, he will be able to use his evil eye not only to debuff your players, but also buff his Fomorian allies. He will have six charges of Curse of the Awoken Eye he can use when the initiative count hits 20. Now feel free to get creative with your own customizations, but here are a few I personally created. Let's start with debuffs. On a failed wisdom saving throw, he can put one of your players under the slow spell for 1d4 rounds, and it won't require concentration. This is a spicy debuff for your martial classes. But the spellcaster one will be even spicier, because for them, on a failed wisdom saving throw, they start to lose their connection to the weave for one minute. And whenever they cast a spell, they need to roll a d20. On an even number, they cast it normally, but on an odd number, they take 1d4 force damage for each level of the spell slot as magic explodes around their hands and the spell doesn't work. Now, as for buffs, the first one is rather simple, which allows Agristus to close up wounds and remove scars from his Fomorian followers, healing them for 40 hit points. He can also buff up their muscles and increase their body size and flexibility, essentially granting a haste spell buff for 1d4 rounds, and again, no concentration. He can also increase the size of their brain and briefly boost their mental capacity, increasing their evil eye damage by an extra 2d6 and giving them advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. And finally, he can also cause a Fomorian to sprout wings, allowing them to fly for one minute. And to top it all off, he can also bestow these buffs upon himself, elevating this encounter even more. And with all the body manipulation, curses, and utter destruction, this will surely be an encounter your players will remember. So, a gorgeous underground king who can deform your party on command? I think this is all quite spicy enough, but if we wanted to, how can we make it even spicier? Well, one is, of course, homebrewing even wackier mutations for our Fomorian king to both hinder your players and buff his allies. Making your players vulnerable to certain damage, making the Fomorians resistant to certain damage, or giving the Fomorians additional limbs for extra attacks and more are are all viable options. Another way to flavor it up is to plant even more unique creatures amongst the Fomorian slaves, which will make the inevitable combat feel more ingrained in your world. And finally, is there a way to link the Fomorian king to your campaign's big bad? That way your players can explore the Fomorians even further, and it will create a grander reward for your players after they defeat the Fomorian king. But anyways, this is just one of many ways you can use Fomorians in your Dungeons & Dragons campaign. But if you do use this in your future games, make sure to let me know how it goes. And of course, I'm always accepting challenges, so feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching and indulging my hidden nerdy side.